Okay, so now that we have a basic overview of how Render Man lights work, uh, let's actually light this car. Uh, and uh, as per usual, the first thing I want to do is find a reference. So I searched for car studio lighting because that is the scenario that we will be doing. Um, and we can just kind of look through and, and see what we like. You'll notice a lot of kind of common themes here, and that's this big soft box over the top. All right, it's in a ton of a ton of car lighting, um, and what that does is it creates these nice kind of contouring highlights here on the car. Cars are very difficult to light well and to shoot well, um, but there are some certainly tried and true methods um, that uh, that work. So uh, I'm just going to kind of look through and see. See if I can find something that I like. I think this is an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, concept. So maybe we'll try this one first. And so I've got this this uh, Evo model. Uh, and I guess the first thing we'll do is just uh, let's start with the, the main light overhead. So the first. Uh, kind of the key light here, the, the, the primary source of illumination, is going to be a big softbox right over the top. And so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to right click on the light and choose a rectangular light. I will then move it up. Uh, and I want to get to my um, light rotation values here. So I'm going to deselect it and then just click deselect it again. And I'm going to rotate this around the x-axis, a negative 90 degrees. All right. I'm also going to name it before I forget. And I will say um, overhead key light is what I'm going to call this. Then I'm going to scale this to roughly the length of the car and roughly the width. Okay. So if I hit the spacebar and look at this, whoops, I want to see this in the quad view. There we go. I can look at this in the top view and kind of get a better sense of it. Okay. And now, and to me, it looks like this light kind of ends just short of the car and about mid tire or so. So I'm going to roughly replicate that. It's, I mean, we're not committing to anything. It's easy enough to change this later on. Uh, and then I'm going to move this up a little bit more. OK. And I'm going to hit IPR. And then I'm going to wait. There we go. So there's the IPR, and we can start to see the car. Uh, it does have a. Uh, Renderman preset uh, metallic paint shader on it. Uh, we're doing all right. Um, next, what I want to do is I want to add a camera. Uh, we haven't really talked about cameras yet, but if we're going to be lighting trying to mimic this scene, then we're going to need to put a camera in place so that we can kind of get back to that view. And so the way that we do that is I'm going to actually turn off my IPR. Uh, if we go up to Create, Cameras, and then we've got three options here. We have Camera, Camera and Aim, Camera, Aim, and Up. And so these are extra controls for the camera. If we just do Camera, it gives us just that. It gives us this camera. And if we go to, in our viewport, we go to Panels, Perspective, and Camera 1. Now we're looking through that camera. All right, if I go to quad view here, I'll change this one back to uh, oops, my camera. As I move and, and change my viewport in, in this view, you can see how the camera moves around in the other viewports. Okay, if I zoom in, that camera moves in. Rotate around, the camera moves, all of that. All right. Um, so that's, that's regular camera. Next, we have 
camera and aim. And what that gives us, again, I'm going to set this view to camera. Uh, that gives us two controls. We have the camera still. But we also have this look target right here. And what this does is wherever this is, is where the camera points. So I can set this, let's say I want to set this right on the tire. Okay, I can position it right on the back tire here. And then I can select my camera. And wherever I move that camera, it's going to be looking at the tire. Okay, which is a cool way to do nice, like, uh, tracking shots across. All right. Pretty cool, pretty easy. I like it. The, uh, oh, also, so this, this creates, you've got your camera, you've got your target, and then it actually creates a camera group. So if I hit, select one of them, hit the up arrow, Let's try that again, hit the up arrow, you've got your camera one group. The last one is camera aim and up, which gives you a third control, uh, which is, I'm gonna select the whole group and just move it back so we can kinda see what's going on here. This third control is which direction the camera, the, the top of the camera is pointing. So. Again, I'll change my perspective view to camera one. And I'm going to, again, set my target here. Careful when you move the, the, the look target in when you're looking through the camera. It can get really sensitive because you're as you move the mouse, you're not only moving where the camera's looking, you're also moving the view and it, it basically multiplies itself. So. That's why I'll often do it from other views. Um, I can move the camera up. But I've got this up control right here. And as I move that, you'll see the camera will, t uh, will not tilt. Hold on. Did I select the right thing? There we go. Well, that's supposed to be working. Let me hit the up. Huh. Why isn't that working? I'll go back to perspective. Okay. Ha, I see. No, that doesn't make any sense at all. Never mind. I don't know why that wasn't working uh, before, and then now suddenly it does. I guess it's just screwing with me. All right, so I'll go back to camera one. Let's go to quad view. So as I adjust the camera up, you can see the camera rolls. Okay, so this is how you can get Dutch angles and make things kind of dramatic, right? So, but for this first uh, first shot, we don't need that. That's the perspective camera. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a camera and that'll be it for this first shot because we don't really need it it's just a kind of a locked off shot here and uh, I'm going to set my perspective view to perspective camera one and I'm going to name camera one we'll say um, cam uh, underscore side okay and then I will position the camera in such a way that reflects my reference. All right. Now I've got a few more controls for this camera. Um, I'm going to hide the, these, this other stuff here. I'm just going to right click and, or not right click, select and hide. Okay, control H is the shortcut to hide these things. Or don't hide, that's fine too. I didn't just turn off texture placement. There we go. Um, so I select this camera and I'm going to go to my attribute editor. And I've got a bunch more camera controls. And I'm going to maximize my camera's view. I have, first of all, you can switch between camera, camera and aim, camera aim and up with this drop down so you don't have to delete and create a new camera. Uh, angle of view. Uh, and focal length are related, 
So as I move one, the other changes. I tend to stay in focal length because this is how actual camera lenses are kind of um, described. So focal length of 35, that's a 35 millimeter lens, um, which is roughly what your eye sees. Um, you can go really wide. And so if you go really wide to like, let's say eight, that's getting into like fisheye territory. See how stretched this grid is. Um, or you can go longer. And if we go to like uh, around 100, then we're getting into the telephoto lens, zoom, or not zoom lens, but a telephoto lens kind of territory, really long lens. Um, for this car, it looks like, and uh, it doesn't look like there's a lot of like warping and distortion that a fisheye lens would cause. So I'm going to guess that this was shot with a 85 maybe? We'll say 85. We'll see how it looks. So I'm going to set my focal length to 85 millimeters. And what it does is it, it basically zooms the lens in, which means now what I have to do is I have to move the, ca the camera away. <laughs> All right. So I can use my normal viewport controls. So I'm going to control or click in the, in the viewport control, right click. No, it's not going to. Oops. Q. OK. Nope. OK, I can also just mouse wheel back um, and then option middle click and drag to kind of reposition a little bit I'm going to bring up my outliner on my other monitor just so I can quickly select the camera from wherever I am um, okay so you can see as I as I zoom in as I use the scroll wheel, it's moving the camera in and out. It's not actually affecting the focal length. It's not zooming the camera. Um, near and far clip plane. So this is like if something gets way too close to the camera, you, it'll disappear. You won't see it. And then you've got a far clip plane as well. Um, and you could actually just turn those toggles on and off. Uh, film back so this is like the size of the sensor is what this is representing um, film gate is like the aspect ratio the size of the viewport so if you want um, kind of standard widescreen you can do a 35 millimeter 1.85 which is 16 by 9 click on that and again we're gonna have to zoom out just a touch here um, and what will help is we want to see the edges of the frame in the viewport. So we click up in the in the viewport, we've got this icon right here, film gate, click on that, and now we can see the edges of our frame. And that looks actually pretty good. You can change these all manually, but the presets are, are pretty good. Um, you can also set uh, over scan, I don't need that. Uh, let's see, what else do we need to cover? I think we're good there. Depth of field, we'll get to a little later. We can turn that on. Um, environment, we don't need any of those. You can change your background color in the environment tab. Also add an image plane. Uh, display options, this is the checkbox. It's the same thing as clicking this button up at the top menu. Display film gate. You can also change the opacity of the film gate. If, if that's annoying, you want it to be less obvious, you can do that. You can also change the color of it. Uh, I'm just going to keep it at 0.7. If you want, if you need uh, action safe and title safe, and you want to see the center of the frame, you can turn on all of your normal frame guidelines. Um, if you're familiar with that, and I think that'll basically cover us for what we need. Okay, primarily what I adjust is film gate. Uh, and focal length and uh, depth of field when I'm ready for it. So I've got my camera set up. Um, now I can go back to lighting. I'm going to switch my perspective back to uh, perspective so that I can uh, move around freely. And I need to make this light just a little bit wider, so I'm going to scale it the width so it's 
overhangs the car just a little bit. All right, um, I'm going to bring up my render settings, and in the common tab, I'm going to make sure my renderable camera is cam side. All right, so that's the one that I want to render with, and let's hit IPR render. Oh, it contains unknown nodes or data. Okay, I don't know what that means. It doesn't seem to want to uh, render. Oh wait. Oh fun error. Mostly back to where I was before my quit. Um, I should learn my lesson and actually save my scenes. So I'm going to set my project to my working project here, and then uh, I already did this, but I'm going to save the scene as a new version in that project so everything's in one place. So I've got my camera set up back to where it was. Um, what I want to do right now is I'm going to choose one of these um, vert or horizontal panel layouts. All right, so I've got two views. And this bottom view, I'm going to space, right click, uh, and go to my perspective view. So now I've got two perspective views. One of them I'm going to set to the camera. Uh, and the other is going to be my perspective view that I can work in uh, freely. So it's just how I choose to set up. If you've got more monitor space, you can probably work in the quad view just fine. Um, this is the most efficient thing for me. So uh, I need to add my rectangular light again. And I'm going to move that up. And we're going to rotate this negative uh, 90 along the x-axis, and then we need to scale this, whoops, scale this. And I'm going to go to my top view, scale it that way. We're going to scale it this way. And again, I want this to overhang just a little bit. Something like that. Okay. I'm going to save it, and I'm going to click on my lower pane here, and I'm going to hit render, our IPR render in this case, and let's see what happens. Here's the result, and um, overall I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, I think we could probably widen it a little bit more so we get a little bit more bleed down the side. Um, but first, we've got the the front and the back are very dark. So if we compare these to our reference, and I know it's reversed the other way, um, we're getting these highlights, and these highlights can probably go even stronger. So that tells me I can up the intensity of that light. So with that light selected, I'm going to go to my attribute editor, and I'm going to set my exposure to 1. See, that brightens it up a little bit. Uh, let's go to 2. There we go. It's actually looking pretty good. And you can see my materials are not properly mapped. I'm going to ignore that for now. Uh, and yeah, so I've got the top light done. Now I want to do uh, a couple lights on the side. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to change this to my... Whoops. My IPR render is freaking out. Close that. Don't save. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to change this to my perspective view. And I'm going to add a new rectangular light. I'm going to move it to the front of the car. And I'm going to rotate it around. So we can rotate this 90 degrees. Oh, looks like we need to be negative 90 degrees. I'm going to move it up. I'm going to move it away. And then I'm going to scale it up. So a lot of big soft sources uh, for car lights and a lot of studio light in general. It just gives nice pleasing shadows and fall off. Uh, we do need to, however, move this to the center of the car. Apologies, I provided you with a file that the car was not centered in the scene. Um, I'm sure it's probably driving you nuts if you're anything like me. But we can, we can make do for now. It will be OK. All right, I'm going to maybe scale that up a little bit wider. Oops. Uh, let's see. Let's bring that to perspective view. 
go something like that. And I'm going to move it away. And then uh, I'm going to duplicate this and move the light with this duplicated light over here, rotate it to positive 90 degrees. And then I'm going to render my IPR and see what it's looking like. are the current results and that's looking pretty good we can actually see the edges of the car now uh, I still can't really see the top here the top of this fin so I'm going to make my top light much larger um, and you can see in some of these examples exactly how big that soft box is sometimes so this is you know, two or three times the size of the actual car. Um, and that's how you get the, the overhang across it. So that is what I'm going to do now. So I've got this selected. I'm going to scale it even wider. And I'll bring the IPR here so you can kind of watch. So this was the before. You can see how that fin and the, the nose fall off. And as I expand out past it, now you can see that again. And I can go the same thing in this direction. Oops, I don't actually think I want to go that direction. I want to go. I gotta rotate my view around a little bit. There we go. Go a little bit wider there too. We go super wide. You can see that now we're getting too much highlight. Okay, so I'm gonna back that off so we're only getting just just a touch there. I think that's uh, more interesting. Okay, so that's actually pretty good, and I think it's, it demonstrates the point to you guys um, pretty well. The last thing that I want to do is play around with the ground plane. So I'm going to make this, if we look here in this viewport, I don't like how it ends in the near, uh, on the near side, so I'm going to scale this up in this direction. A lot, and I may need to restart my IPR render to see that. So it'll take a second. There it goes. Oh, and I've got my perspective view active, so I just need to click down here, and it should update in a second. If not, I will force it. Now that ground plane doesn't end in my fore in the foreground of my shot, and I've got my car. Um, so yeah, the last thing that I want to do is actually I'm going to play around with the shaders on my ground plane. So I'm going to give it a new material. And uh, I'm going to go with a RenderMan uh, Pixar surface. And I'm going to make it darker. Not completely black, but much darker here. I mean, you can kind of, as you play with these, you can see how that affects. So if I go white, that's that's one look. And I could I could go, like, mostly white there. And then if I select my camera, I could change my environment, brighten that up. And do I have to re-render that, maybe? Okay, so I made my environment whiter, and now I've got that white background. I don't like that at all, uh, but you can do it. So, you know, that's something. I'll bring that back down to black. Uh, with my ground plane selected, my surface, I'm actually going to name the surface uh, ground plane and restart the render. While that restarts, I'm going to again make this pretty dark. And make sure I choose my camera's view. Uh, and then what I want to do, oops, in my attribute editor here, is I want to make it a more specular, more glossy surface. Okay. So, got attribute editor there, and I'm going to select my ground plane. And 
in my primary specular, so I need to bring up my face color, my edge color. And you can see as I bring these up, we're going to start getting hints of this car in the reflection. Right, we're also going to start seeing the reflection of the overhead light, which is fine. Um, if you don't want to see that reflection of the light, then what you need to do is just kind of bring that light up. You may need to scale it a little bit more too. Um, okay. So you can kind of see that, that reflection if that's what you're going for here. Make that ground a little bit darker. Okay, something like maybe that. And I'm also going to increase the anisotropy. So it's going to give me more elongated reflections. Uh, so let's, let's see which way we need to go. If we go negative, there we go. So now we've got more elongated reflections. Just a, a style thing. Not that uh, big a deal. So let's say that this is exactly what I wanted. Um, which it's definitely not, but ooh, I kind of like that. Yeah, OK. So let's say this is what I'm going for, and now I'm ready to actually render this. Well, now we need to, I'm going to quit my IPR render, and I'm going to open up my render settings. And so let's go through this a little bit more detail than I have previously. Uh, I know I've been through the, the common tab before, but just to as a refresher, because it's now very relevant. Uh, you've got your render using, so this is your render engine, we want render man. Uh, file output, you can choose your image format. Uh, I'm going to choose a just an 8-bit TIFF for now. We just want single frame, so name.extension is perfect. Uh, renderable camera, Choose that uh, alpha channel. We got your preset image size. So for this, we'll do we'll do a 720 render. Um, and that's really all I have to worry about in the common tab. In sampling, this is where we set the quality of our render. So 128 is pretty low. Uh, if you go lower, it's going to be even grainier, uh, especially in the in the shadows. But for for a nice polished render, I'll probably be up around at least 10, uh, 1024, but sometimes I'll go like 2048. Uh, for this, I'll just do like 512. And then I don't know if there's anything else we really need to worry about here. If you're rendering with glass and or, and or liquids and fluids, you'll want to check the allow caustics button. Check uh, right there. And Everything else should be good. Uh, lighting samples, media samples, indirect samples. It's how many times light is going to bounce around. Um, we can keep it at one for now. As you increase that, you'll get more accuracy. It'll also drastically increase the amount of time uh, the renders take. Uh, the only other thing in features, you've got a motion blur option, which isn't relevant for stills. When we get to animation, that'll be that'll be relevant. Uh, yeah, that's all I want to worry about for now. So basically, I just set the max samples to 512. I can click close. And then uh, I just have to hit render. And then wait. Rendering. Uh, I'm going to, in my render window, I'm going to turn on my catalog and my inspector. And then I'm going to go to view and resize window to image. So now I can see. I got some information about this render, how many samples it's rendering. Uh, when it's done, it'll tell me how long it took. Also tells me how many samples it's it's taking. Um, and then on the side here, as I render, you'll see the renders will fill up, and I can compare them. I know I've showed that before. Um, so as you see, this this noise is particularly in the shadows and the reflections. As you increase the samples, um, that noise will decrease. So if you, if you see a lot of that, then you just need to up the samples. Um, 
this is rendering you know each section by section and it's going to do it 512 times so it will take a little bit especially since i'm currently recording the screen um, and then what we will need to do is just save this out now render man is set up to use a linear color workflow which provides the most information in the renders but much like shooting raw or log um, video, it's going to look like a very flat image that doesn't look like what it looks like here on the screen right now. So we need to tell Maya to basically apply the settings that it's displaying with to the saved image. Uh, and that option is in the catalog menu, burn in mapping on save. We want to make sure that that is checked. Okay, that's going to be important. Uh, and then once this is done rendering, you can see it's slowly going, the noise is decreasing. Um, it'll just be file, export file, and I'm going to give it just another minute. Um, not too much longer, though. I'm going to hit escape to stop the render, because that's, I think, enough. You get the point at, the <laughs> at this point. So it's been rendering for three minutes, uh, or officially two minutes and 36 seconds. Uh, now that I have it rendered, I can go to File and Export File. And I can choose where to save this. I can also choose my file type. So I can do I can even do a JPEG or a PNG. We'll do JPEG, that's fine. And car lighting class, uh, and I'll just say V1. And I can choose my location. I like to render uh, my files to, uh, let me just click this to my project file and then the images folder. That's where I like to save them. I'll just click save. And then I can go and navigate to that folder, which is hidden behind this, to my images, and here it is. OK, there's the render. So that's one render and one angle. Now let's say I wanted to do another angle. Well, what I would do. There's, there's a few different ways you can do this, but f for you guys here in this intro 3D class, um, here's what I'm going to recommend. I'm going to take the elements of the scene for this lighting setup, uh, which are uh, maximize this view. So it's the camera, the ground plane, and both of my lights. And then I'm going to go to my layer editor and Layers, create layer from selected, and I'm going to call this lights one underscore side, just so I know what lighting setup that was. Click save. Now I can turn off that layer, and I can basically start again, but I still have my other setup saved. Okay, and I am going to want multiple setups for your renders. So now um, I can find another reference image and I can apply it and, and start lighting it and render out a new, a new scene. Um, the one last thing I want to show you here, uh, actually there's two last things. Uh, one of them is uh, a, a different, a slightly more advanced backdrop. So to create this new backdrop, I want one that is uh, basically a psych, an infinity psych, so you see this curved wall here. All right. So that's what I want to create here. And the way I'm going to do that is with a cylinder. I'm going to rotate this cylinder. Uh, well, in this case, we'll do it around the x-axis. Oops. And I'm going to select that, and I will move it this way. And I'm going to go into face mode. I'm going to delete all of the f f front half faces. Hit delete. I'm going to delete all of the top faces. Hit delete. OK, and then I'm going to delete all of the end faces. I don't need those either. So I just have this kind of semi, this quarter of a circle, right? Once I have that, I'm going to bring it up and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my point snapping and I'm going to snap the or the pivot point 
to that bottom edge. And then I'm going to snap that bottom edge to the grid. Okay, and then I'm going to scale it in the width. And you can actually scale it up in this direction too. So it's a, a larger uh, transition. Uh, and then the last thing I need to do is just select the top edge. I'm going to extrude that and just move it up vertically. I'm going to select the bottom edge, extrude edge, move that horizontally. Um, for shading purposes, I am going to add a couple extra edge loops. So edge, shift right click, insert edge loop tool. Do multiple edge loops and I'll do, I don't know, 10 will be fine. And it's just going to make the, uh, there. Let us allow the shadows to, and the, kind of the textures to, to work a little bit better. Uh, and the last thing I need to do is uh, mesh display and reverse my normals so the texture is on the right side. Um, you see this is a little bit rigid. I probably should have scaled this uh, contour up a little bit more. So you can always just actually scale the whole thing up. Okay. So now when we light it, we can have a nice kind of natural fall off on the back. Um, also allows for some nice silhouettes. Uh, you can also kind of rotate this around, move it around in place. Again, you can have a new backdrop for every lighting setup if you want. Just kind of try different angles and things. Um, okay, so now I can add a disk light here. Rotate this down. Scale this up. And bring this over here. Okay, my scales are slightly off. I'll show you a, a finished version of, of, of a studio lighting setup in a minute, but Grab that, go to the attribute editor, I'll set the exposure to like 5, and hit render, and wait. Okay, so now we have our, you know, this is going to be an interesting way to kind of create a silhouette. Right there, jump back to my IPR render, okay. so. Don't just think about changing how your lights are set up. Also think about your backdrop, if you want just a plane or kind of an infinity psych situation. Um, and then think about where you're putting your camera, what the lens length is. And again, this is why I don't expect you all to be you know, cinematographers or anything like that. Just find reference and, and find something you like and try to repl replicate it. Rendered a separate uh, angle. And for this, I actually kept the lights most of the same. I added an extra light underneath the car to, to kind of separate a little bit more. Uh, please ignore the fact that the back tire is not touching the ground. We'll just pretend it's in motion and it's just torque lifting the tire, um, even though it's steering in a dead straight line. But we'll just pretend. Um, so I've got this, and it's, it's okay. It's grainy, so we obviously need more samples. Uh, but there's one other thing that we can do to make this look a lot cooler, and that's depth of field. So uh, in the camera settings, I have the camera shape selected. Uh, I scroll to the depth of field, which I'm sure I just passed because I can't talk and read at the same time. It turns out uh, depth of field, click check mark to enable it. And you can see that the viewport actually does a pretty decent job of previewing it. And my IPR render also freaks out. Um, so the, there's two main controls that you need out of the three. There's focus distance and there's f-stop. So First, let's talk about focus distance. This is probably the more intuitive. And this is how, exactly how far away from the camera are you focusing. All right. Um, all cameras need to focus. I wish I wish this was a slider and I just deselected the thing that I need. Uh, again, this is why having the outliner open is so helpful. Camera. There we go. Um, incidentally, also, just to, to walk you through how I did this, uh, I also added a three node camera so that I could um, tilt, roll the camera a little bit, give it a Dutch angle, uh, add some drama to it. Anyway, this focus distance, so I can adjust this, and if I go to 10, and now we're focused way back here, 
And if I go to like seven, I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, if I go to like four, uh, I don't remember where this started. I think I'm too short, so like 4.8. Uh, and so you can kind of play around with that. The other control is f-stop. F-stop, <coughs> excuse me, f-stop refers to how open the iris is, how, how open the aperture is in the camera. I don't want to get too far into how cameras work. Um, but the takeaway that you need for this is that the bigger the number, the smaller the opening, and the more in focus you're going to have. Okay, so if you get closer to zero, it's like you're zeroing out what's in focus. It's less in focus. Smaller number, less is in focus. Bigger number, more is in focus. Okay, and this goes up to 64 on the slider. And so we can kind of play around with it and get something that feels exciting. And then we can maybe adjust the focus distance a little bit more. Maybe I'll go back to five. Well, go 4.9. Um, and then, so that's, that's great for this one circumstance, uh, while that renders in the IPR, I'm going to, uh, quickly jump to my quad view and show one other tip, uh, and that is the measure tool. So if you really want to be specific about your focus distance, let's say I wanted to focus and make sure that this back part of the tire was in focus, what I could do is I'm going to go in my perspective here. And in the create measure tools distance, click on that. And then you can see in the bottom here, the tool tip whoops, uh, says click to pick point to measure distance from. So I'm going to click on the tire and then click point to measure distance to and click on the camera. Now, I obviously that didn't really put those where I want them, but it creates these points that I can now manipulate and kind of move around and get exactly where I want them. I can even turn on point snapping if I'm trying to snap to an object, uh, which this doesn't really work with the camera. But we can kind of move around, get it in place. Again, this is where quad view really helps. So I can position it from the top and then position it from the front, make sure the height is there. Okay, that's looking pretty good. And then the other side, select the other part of it. And I don't think I have the right thing selected. So I can go to my outliner. Again, outliner, super, super helpful. Uh, I've got my locator one, which is what I want. And now here I can turn on my point snapping and I'm going to click and drag. Okay, now I'm on that back edge of the rim. So that gives me... Where'd my outliner go? This gives me this measurement, which is 5.774865. There's my outliner. Um, and... Click my locator tab, I think it will tell me. Maybe not. Can't remember where it tells you the uh, actual output measurement. But I just remember 5.774. That's easy enough. So I can go back to my camera, select that, set my uh, go to camera shape. 5.774, hit return. And then go back to my camera view. You can see that now that tire is perfectly in focus. And it's going to render as such. So if you're not if you're having trouble getting it exactly where you want it, you can bring up that measure tool uh, and use that. But I'm going to keep it back at 4.9. I think that's a better point for it. Uh, and then as this renders, this will take a moment. Um, I think it just it gives it more more life and more more realism. Uh, I caution you. I probably have the f stop too low here. Uh, don't overdo it. So you know a little bit goes a long way. So I can actually go up probably to like thirty two, because we'll still get some nice fall off in the back here. Um, we'll keep the the front end a little bit sharper in focus.
and a half minutes later, uh, you can see the results of the render. Uh, this is again 512 samples, and I'm rendering 720, so 1280 by 720. Um, looks great. There's a little bit of noise here in the shadowed reflections, but uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the results here. And you can see bringing that uh, depth of field up, you know, increasing the depth of field uh, to like 32 really helped. It, it feels more natural than if I was all the way down at 8 or 12 or whatever I was at before. So that's it. And then uh, in uh, don't have class next week, so in two weeks, we'll talk about taking these renders uh, into Photoshop and giving them kind of a finishing pass.